Detroit, and will be attending Wayne State University in the fall in the Behavioral and Cognitive Neuroscience program uh, at Wayne State University. Hello, my name is Marcelio Shimami. I also joined Rebuild in 2017 and graduated in 2021. Uh, we were both part of cohort three and we're really excited to be here with you guys today. I'm currently at MSU working on my PhD in genetics and genomic sciences uh, in reproductive biology um, and we're really excited to be here with you today. Um, just a couple words um, on like my experience from Rebuild that I think is important to take from this moment. As you join this community and become scientists, you'll grow more in your knowledge and your faith in yourself and knowing what you're talking about in this moment, it may not seem like it, but I remember sitting in your seat exactly four years ago, and I remember how scared I was to really start doing real science. It's a different experience, it's a different atmosphere. And just have confidence in yourself and the people around you because they've done it and they've done it a million times over. So your faith is in the right people. This program has taken me further than I could ever have imagined. It's given me more opportunities, and I think the real message here today is just have faith and continue to have faith and take the right steps to continue forward. Um, with that said, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Pamela Zarkowski, who is the provost of Detroit Mercy. Well, good evening, and that's already a great start to hear both of your stories. How exciting and, and uh, um, how wonderful. It's my uh, great pleasure to welcome our guests and our students uh, this evening from both Wayne State and University of Detroit Mercy. I'd love to tell you the history of Detroit Mercy, but I wanna welcome you to our campus. You can see we're under construction at the Student Union here, and we're excited about that. Uh, this university was started in 1877 by the Society of Jesus, and uh, the Mercy College was started in 1940s, and we merged uh, those two universities in 1990. I say this to say that both for our history, and I am a grad of the School of Law of Wayne State, so I do have that in my background and blood as well, um, that we have two great universities working together to really support you. And what's so exciting about this is receiving your lab coat, I'm not gonna talk too long, uh, this evening is really the start of what I think a student scholar journey for yourself, and I appreciated your comments about being a scientist. I only wish when I, I have envy, I have lab coat envy. <laughs> um, and by that I mean, I only wish I could have received something like that in my undergraduate career in order to begin doing research. And, and you may be familiar with this, you'll become more familiar with this, but the idea of talking about hypothesis, collecting data, analyzing data, this may lead to posters, this may lead to publications, this will lead to just an exciting resume for you. And that resume just isn't a piece of paper. It's going to be something that you can talk about when you apply to graduate schools or professional schools or you're looking for a job. To be able to say, I started researching early in my career, and as a result of that, and I can't even pronounce some of the research you're going to do, trust me, um, but is so exciting and such a star. Remember when we were growing up in school, you got a star if you did something good or a stamp. This is just so exciting. What's even more exciting is I know you're going to be working with mentors from Wayne State, Detroit Mercy, and what was said a little earlier, they've done this a million times over. I don't know if they would admit to a million times, but they are good at what they do, and we are so proud, and they want to work with you, which is why they're engaged in this program. So I want to congratulate you. I want to tell you, even though it looks like a white coat, those threads of research, those threads of faith, those threads that you can do it, the knowledge are all hidden within that coat. And so it really gives you strength, it'll give you inspiration, it'll give you and help you blossom in the talents that you all have. So I'll stick with my lab coat envy and wish you well and congratulate you. And for the guests behind you, this is such an exciting day. You gotta cheer and yell when they get their coats. Promise you'll do that. All right, thank you very much and have a great summer. Thank you so much, Dr. Zarkowski. I would now like to introduce Dr. Amanda Bryant-Frederick from Wayne State University. Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome today. It is on the behalf of the President and Provost of Wayne State University 
that I stand before you today to welcome you to this lab coat ceremony. Uh, I was an undergraduate researcher many, many years ago. You see the gray hair. And it was formative. It was the thing that made me the person that I am. It gives me the drive for everything that I do today that someone <laughs> poured into me at that time in my life. And now I am a professor of pharmaceutical sciences at Wayne State University, where I lead a research lab that focuses on the development of antiviral agents. So I know what this beginning means. I know from personal experience what that coat is going to mean. White coat ceremonies are a tradition filled with ritual, which began in, around 1990, believe it or not. It wasn't that long ago. In the US, its original intent was to introduce medical students to the well-defined guidelines regarding the expectations and responsibilities appropriate for the medical profession. Many professions with origins in the biomedical sciences use this ceremony to fulfill the same type of purpose. Our ceremony today is to introduce budding researchers to the um, ability, build a budding researchers to the expectations and responsibilities of biomedical research. By donning a white coat in the biomedical sciences, you make a statement to the world that you have the ability and desire to create new knowledge and to improve the human condition. It always also indicates that you will perform this research in pursuit of this goal in an ethical and responsible manner with respect for resources, knowledge, intellectual property, and all those in your profession. So the Rebuild Detroit program invites each scholar to bring all they are to their experience. For a very long time, the research community has not realized that it harms itself and those it tends to serve by not creating an environment in which ability and desire can reach its full potential. These barriers come in many forms and the Rebuild Detroit program is here to provide a compass for each scholar to navigate around those barriers on the pathway to academic and personal success. Now in its ninth year, we realize that we have a formula that works through the success of past scholars who are embarking on meaningful and exciting careers on which their training in the biomedical sciences is built. This program would not be possible without the faculty members who invite our scholars into their intellectual territory, providing them with insight into their thought processes and the execution of projects to tackle some of the world's most difficult problems. We greatly appreciate their openness to share their knowledge, experience, and training with our scholars. In addition to these individuals, there are many who are the backbone of the Rebuild Detroit program, anticipating obstacles for our scholars before they do, and offering their unwavering emotional, personal, and professional support to clear the path to success. To them, we must also say thank you. And last but not least, the resources to support the Rebuild Detroit program come from many places, with the primary support coming from the National Institutes of Health, UDM, and Wayne State University. So scientists, as you don your white coat, remember that you belong here. You are part of the scientific enterprise, and you are definitely a scientist. Thank you. Next, we'd like to welcome up Najat Assad, a student from Detroit Mercy in this year's cohort. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Najat Assad, and before I begin, I just want to thank you all so much for being here and for helping us celebrate our first year in the Rebuild Detroit program. I also want to thank you for wanting to be a part of our research journeys as it will be one of the most exciting times of our undergrad experience. When I first joined the Rebuild Detroit program, I had my own ideas of what a researcher looks like and what a researcher does. After taking psychological research seminars with Dr. Green and Dr. Abraham for the past two semesters, I've acquired many research skills. I've acquired many research skills and lessons that have changed my entire perception of what a scientist does. I went into both courses feeling a little nervous as you would for any new course. 
but it quickly changed into the desire to learn and grow. Each week, we developed new skill sets that helped us practice on ethical approaches during research. And thank you to Dr. Abraham and Dr. Green. We have also learned how to properly conduct a literature search, how to implement scientific diction into the research paper, how to interpret statistical data from a psychological research paper, and how to synthesize each section of the scientific method. This past semester, I also got the chance to practice writing my own research paper on religiosity's impact on distress tolerance among emerging adults, with the help of Dr. Abraham, of course. This experience certainly changed my entire perception of research, and it helped me develop a much greater appreciation for all those in research who are contributing to science in one way or another. From the very first steps of writing the background section and present study, to the very end of writing and recording the results and discussion section, I now have a better understanding of how much planning and patience it takes to become a researcher and write a research paper. But I think that some of the most valuable lessons I learned are not from the research itself, but the role of diversity in science. A lot of us grew up with this implicit bias of how a scientist is supposed to look like. Maybe that might have been influenced by the media. But this past year has really proven to me that all of us in here are the face of science. We are the face of science, and it is our curiosity, our passion, and our desire to be of service to society that brings us together today. And I think, if anything, that should help us feel confident in our transition to research. To get over the struggle with imposter syndrome that I'm sure we all felt in the beginning of BUILD, we need to remember that a real scientist does not know all the answers. The best research comes from those who don't know all the answers, but are trying and eager to figure them out and explain them to the best of their abilities to the public. I want to personally thank Dr. Shatina and Mr. Sanders and Mr. Tommy and all of the other faculty members who helped us learn these valuable lessons throughout the year through their constant support and through their weekly checkups on us. I'm so grateful to be a part of this community that cares so much about our future. And to all of my fellow scholars, I am so happy that we will get to see each other's accomplishments through the years and support one another as we begin this journey. This summer, I will get the chance to be working with Dr. Miao Chen in her child's social cognitive development lab to get a better understanding on how racial and ethnic implicit bias develops in children. I am so passionate and excited to be researching a topic that I've always wanted to. Good luck to all of the other scholars who will be starting their summer research as well. I cannot wait for us to share these moments with each other, motivate each other, celebrate each other, and learn together. Thank you so much. I hope you all have and hold on to that curiosity and love for science. I would now like to introduce Madeline Urema for our next student reflection. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, just like Najat had mentioned, before I begin, I would, to thank, I would like to thank you all for coming. Whether you may be a family member, a mentor, or even just a friend supporting another friend, you have all helped us in our journey to get to this point in our academic careers. We very much are very thankful for you to help celebrate all of our achievements as the newest cohort of Rebuild Detroit students. You have all helped in preparing us for this moment, and I am confident that without each and every one of you, we would not be in the same position that we are today. Like we've already mentioned, my name is Madeline Urema, and I'm a rising sophomore at the Wayne State University Rebuild Detroit program. I am honored to be the, vo the voice of my cohort tonight, and I will do my very best to highlight all of our feelings, experiences, and hopes for the upcoming year. Rebuild for us all started last summer. When he found out about the program in different ways, I knew that something resonated with each person in the room. For myself, getting an email that advertised how I could be surrounded by people like myself to rebuild and redefine the structure of biomedicine was exciting, and the financial support certainly did not hurt. While each experience and different uh, person has different life stories, it is part of what makes us truly unique. While we represent a group of inclusion and diversity of scholars right now, we will soon be some of the best scientists and providers who can both inspire and help for generations to come. While I could not have imagined what the first year would bring, I'm truly amazed at how helpful the program truly is. Being surrounded by peers who have the same hopes and aspirations as myself has given me a sense of community. 
Having classes that give us experience with research labs and instrumentation has given me a vast amount of confidence and experience. And working with faculty who have supported us in our scholastic endeavors has empowered me. We have had the privilege of working with amazing people who wear many different hats, including those of doctor, teacher, and mentor. These people have given us all of the resources that I never could have dreamt of. Being surrounded by some of the greatest minds that I've ever met has forced me to consider myself as a scientist too, even if I have much less experience and knowledge. When we first began the program, we were just shy strangers. The only seemingly thing that we had in common was that we signed up for summer Zoom classes. We all struggled to speak confidently about our goals and simply prefaced our aspirations with the phrase, I hope. However, Dr. Amanda would not stand for that. Those hopes were to become doctors or clinical psychologists, and we struggled to picture what we, what we would just be doing in the next five and 10 years. The transformation in our mindsets was just the beginning. I hope for us all that we will further picture ourselves as the future of both science and medicine as we strengthen our knowledge, build our relationships, and gain confidence in a laboratory setting. While I know some of us, including myself, are a little bit nervous about the new experience, I also know that it will be a defining moment in all of our build chapters. As we all await what the summer will bring for us, we know that we will all gain beneficial experiences from some of the best minds in research. After just a year, build is so much more than just a scholarship. It's a family. From the early 8.30 a.m. morning meetings to impromptu gatherings in each other's rooms, build has become much more than just research. It's become my closest group of friends here at Wayne State. I've met so many different people from our partner institutions and I know that we are all truly thankful for this opportunity. All of us about to be coded have worked extremely hard in our respective programs and institutions for our first year at college and have committed to spending this summer in labs and classes instead of going to the beach. I think this speaks volumes about our commitment to medicine and our dedication to inclusion and diversity in this field. I hope that every student in this room will have an amazing experience this summer in their lab spaces and I can assure that we will all work hard for you guys for our future. My goals for my cohort is to do the absolute best that we can do, to make strides in the scientific community, and most of all, to have fun. I strongly believe that this summer, while being filled with hard work, will also be a time to remember, even if we may not find a cure for some disease in our eight weeks. Before I pass on the microphone, I would like to make one more thank you. To Autumn, Emily, Esma, Bernard, Asia, Darius, and Irma, I am beyond grateful for all of you and excited to see what we will do together. I'm excited to be able to rely and support on each and every one of you. For our partners over at UD Mercy and HFC, I can't wait to see and hear about what you do, even if it may be from a distance, and I'm very thankful for each and every one of you in my life. I know that each and every one of us will change the wor world. From doctors of medicine and research to pharmacists and psychologists, I know that we as Rebuild Detroit scholars truly can make a difference in the realm of biomedicine. Thank you. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Vanessa Lee and I was in cohort one of the Rebuild Detroit program at University of Michigan, or Detroit Mercy. See, that's how I know I've been gone for too long. <laughs> I just wanna start off by saying, uh, thank you so much for the BUILD program for inviting me back today and to see how our hard work and dedication has continued to succeed and that we truly made an impact as we're celebrating the white coat ceremony of cohort seven today. Today marks the first day, the first time I've returned to the university since graduating in May of 2019 with my Bachelor's of Science in Nursing and Leadership minor. It's a pleasure to return to a place where everything began and with the people who made me who I am today and what I am doing. I began my bill journey back in summer of 2015, coming as, in as a high school graduate and first generation college student. And as a BUILD scholar, I will never forget the day I was assigned to my first peer mentee, or the day we were told we got our first BUILD room, or all those 8 a.m. times we had to come in 8 a.m. for that summer research um, experience. But being in the BUILD program was one of the best things I've done in my undergrad career. We had our highs and lows, but we definitely stuck together. And what we went through was truly something special and I would not be where I am or who I am today without the BUILD program. I have come to met so many great people and friends through this program 
that inspire me to become a better student, a scientist, nurse, educator, mentor, and all I am today. And I definitely wouldn't be here standing and talking to you and telling you that I graduated from the University of Michigan with my doctorates of nursing practice, specializing in, <laughs> specializing in adult gerontology primary care. At the time of uh, my program at University of Michigan, I was still inspired by Rebuild Detroit and actually created the first peer mentoring program and founded the University of Michigan School of Nursing Graduate Student Peer Mentoring Program. And with my education that I have now, I can teach the next generation of healthcare providers and professionals and treat patients making changes to healthcare on a greater level. And I like to even add that even though I started off in a clinical track, leaving Detroit Mercy did not take my passion away from research and actually helped me find my research passion for geriatric and studying patients who are older adults and have uh, dementia or chronic conditions. So the BUILD program really changes you and I wouldn't say it was easy because it was very hard. Having to balance your time during research, also doing peer mentoring while full-time school and volunteering and attending conferences each week. But I want you to tell you all to keep believing yourself and make goals. I want you to all succeed and stand here in a few years because I know for a fact that students like myself in previous cohorts did everything that we did so that the next group of students would have it better than us. Take advantage of your time here because it'll be a lot faster than you think. Anyways, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, who is very impressive, Dr. Chelsea Spates. She completed her Bachelor's of Science in Microbiology and Honors at Michigan State University and her PhD in Microbiology Immunology at Northwestern University. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan in the Department of Cell and Development Biology, studying the role of host motor proteins in polyomavirus entry and infection. She is also the co-founder, treasurer, and sponsorship lead of the Black Microbiologist Association since 2020 and was featured in New York Times. She also had multiple leadership positions in her work of field, including the Black Postdoc Circle Career Development Committee Chair and Cells and Development Biology Postdoc Representative. She has a great passion for teaching, having various experiences in her career as a mentor and lecturer for students in microbiology and biomedical sciences. And she gives back to her community through outreach and services, like recently speaking at Polo Aldo College to students on becoming a scientist, transforming scientific research into equitable outreach at the American Society for Biochemistry annual conference and increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Please welcome Dr. Chelsea Spinks. Thank you for that introduction. Hope you all can hear me okay. I'm so inspired by you all. I almost feel like I don't really need to give a speech, but I'm going to do it because I prepared one. So, <laughs> good evening uh, to each of you, the Rebuild Detroit Scholars. It is an honor to have been invited to speak with you as you begin your scientific research careers. First though, I would like to take a moment to congratulate you all on finishing your first year of studies. During ordinary times, completing a bachelor's degree is no, ordinary, no easy task, but these are not ordinary times. Amidst the normal challenges and rigors that accompany university studies, you have collectively performed at a high level while navigating a global pandemic on top of civil and political unrest. You are stronger than any of you know just by getting here to this moment. So I want to start by saying congratulations to you all for finishing this important first step. The world has changed so much over the past two years and due to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, science has been thrust into the forefront of many conversations, for better or for worse. As a scientist, and more specifically a microbiologist who studies viruses, it has been exhausting. 
But being here today and seeing each of you, each and every one of you, is rejuvenating. The next generation of scientists, because we need you. I need you and the world needs you. Scientists that they can trust and scientists that look like you. In the US, only about 8% of bachelor's degrees in science are awarded to black or African American students. For Hispanic and Latino students, that number is about 14%. As you can imagine, these numbers decrease with increasing degree levels to where just 4 and 5% of doctoral degrees in science-related fields are awarded to Black and Latino students. Not surprisingly, the workforce also reflects these numbers. And that is why you are so important. Because of structural racism and the mistrust of science and medicine in our communities, that is the result of decades of documented abuse, our people are the ones that have suffered the most during this pandemic. Just by being a part of this program, you are working to change that narrative and our future. So thank you. When I was planning this speech, I wasn't sure what I wanted to say to you, what inspiring piece of advice I could offer to help usher you into your scientific journeys. Ultimately, I decided to tell you what I wish someone had told me when I was where you are right now. And that is that at some point along this journey, you might fail, but also that failing does not make you a failure. And quite, in fact, it can, go, it can do quite the opposite. And my journey into science has not been a straight path. This evening, I want to tell you the story of how I become, became what I like to call not that kind of doctor. Unlike most of you, I'm sure, when I was finishing high school, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. I liked my science classes and I liked animals, so I thought, great, I'll go to college and become a veterinarian. I was accepted to Michigan State University on scholarship and was on my way towards my destiny when my mother informed me that part of my duties as a veterinarian would be to put sick animals to sleep. I was shocked and so quickly ditched that plan. No sweat though, I would just major in biology and see where it took me. I'm not sure about here, but at Michigan State, I was told that there was no biology major. I wasn't pre-med, so human biology was out. Let's see, looking down the list of majors, I saw microbiology and biochemistry. Seemed close enough to me. I asked a guy in the program that I was in at the time for his opinion, and he told me that as a biochemistry major, I should definitely choose microbiology. That's it. That's how my journey to becoming a microbiologist started. You can call it random, but I prefer to think of it as a divine intervention. As a part of the degree requirements, I could either do undergraduate research or take a seminar course. Ironically, I signed up for research because I was terrified of public speaking and didn't want to have to do a seminar presentation. I chose to do research with a woman by the name of Dr. Michelle Fluke. She studied a cancer-causing virus called polyomavirus and used it as a model for understanding breast cancer progression. I fell in love with research, but around the same time, my 88-year-old grandmother was diagnosed with lung cancer. She survived her treatment course and went into remission, but what lingered was my distaste for the way that her doctors had treated her. They were dismissive and patronizing, and it almost changed the course of my life because I thought I could do a better job than them. I can be a doctor and give my patients the treatment that they deserve, regardless of their age, income, or ethnicity. After studying for the MCAT and putting in a ton of applications, I was accepted to the Morehouse School of Medicine uh, for medical school. Oh my goodness, when I say my parents were proud of me, a doctor in the family, they told everyone, everyone, and after graduation, I moved to Atlanta to start my studies. About a month later, I knew that I had made a mistake. I hated it. I remember thinking that I was wishing I was doing research instead. I thought I was homesick. I thought I was just stressed about the workload. I thought, I'll just take the first exam, and if I get an A, then that must mean that it's proof that I should be here. Well, I got an A because I'm good at studying. But it didn't quench the unrest that was inside of me. I called my sister to tell her that I was miserable, and what she told me was so profound. She said, just quit. What? That's not an option. She said, leave if you hate it. I got into med school. That's like really hard. 
Mom and dad will be so disappointed. What will people say? What will they think? They'll think that I couldn't do it, that I failed out of med school. She said, who cares what they think? And she made it seem so easy that it gave me the strength to take the plunge to leave medical school. While I was plotting how to get out of there, I remembered that right before graduation, I attended a lunch meeting to learn about biomedical research PhD programs. I didn't care about PhD programs at the time because I was going to medical school. And I just wanted free pizza. In addition to the food being free, though, I learned that biomedical research PhD programs were also free and that they even paid you a stipend to live on each year. So while I was supposed to be uh, paying attention in class, I was researching PhD programs. In addition to studying, I was making calls to graduate admissions officers to figure out what I needed to do to get into graduate school. But I knew that even though I didn't really know where to begin when applying, I had at least a plan that I could use to convince my parents to let me come home. I called my undergraduate research advisor, Dr. Fluke, and she told me to come back and work with her for the year and that she would help me figure it all out. So that's what I did. I left. And that's the story of how I became a med school dropout. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but that's not the end of my story. A few months after moving home, I found out that I got into graduate school at Northwestern University in Chicago, and I was so excited. I was going to be a doctor, again. <laughs> the excitement lasted all the way until my first semester, when I was questioned by a young male professor whose lab I was working in on whether I should really be in graduate school because I didn't seem passionate enough about science. I think what he really meant to say was, I don't see anyone around here like you, and you don't really fit the mold of what I think a scientist should be. He expected me to fail, so why not just help me out by telling me to leave sooner rather than later? I'm not gonna lie. I went to the bathroom and cried after that conversation. But what he didn't know is that I was no stranger to failure. Been there, done that. And what he was about to learn is that I get to decide when I'm ready to quit and not anyone else. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> so I stayed. I rotated through other labs and ultimately found a research mentor who believed in me and trained me to be the type of scientist that I wanted to be an objective, inquisitive, and compassionate scientist. I graduated with my PhD in microbiology in 2017, so it turns out I did become a doctor, just not that kind of doctor. And while I can't really remember how to perform CPR to save a life, I'm certain that my understanding of viruses has saved many during this pandemic, as I use my knowledge of basic science to explain to my family, friends, and community how viruses work and why vaccination is so important. And that is my full story. From this side of things, I am certain that I made the right decision by leaving medical school, but it wasn't always easy, especially when I looked at my new path as a research scientist and was told that it's virtually impossible to get a tenure track faculty position at a university, let alone as a black woman. According to a 2017 report of all the US tenured professors in the life sciences, only two or 3% are black and only 1% are black women. Academia can be a lonely place for scientists from underrepresented backgrounds. I have often been the only black person in my labs, programs, and departments. I've been told that I only got my positions and my grants because I was black and that they needed to increase diversity. And unfortunately, for many of you venturing into the scientific enterprise, you will likely find yourself in similar circumstances. These places can isolate you and make you feel so alone that you think you don't belong, but you do. To survive, you have to find community, and if you can't find it, you have to build it. Last year, I met four black women microbiologists online, and after realizing that we all felt unsure of our future in research due to the lack of representation at our institutions, we formed the Black Microbiologist Association a nonprofit organization created to provide community where black microbiologists can network across career stages and sectors. We now have over 300 members worldwide, with scientists represented from every continent except for Antarctica. Through this group and others, I found colleagues and mentors to guide me through difficult career transitions 
and I'm happy to say that this summer I will start a tenure track faculty position at the University of Michigan, running my own research lab, studying the connection between viral infection and cancer. So while some may still look at me and think that I failed when I left medical school, I don't see it that way because I know that this is what I'm supposed to do. And that's what I want for each of you. But remember that the value of community to my success cannot be emphasized enough. And you have a great one here. Look around this room. This is your support system. You are invaluable to each other's future success. And speaking of support systems, the next thing that I want you to remember is that there are so many interesting scientific topics that you can study, and it's very tempting to join a lab that you think is doing the coolest, most cutting edge research. But I beg you to instead prioritize the mentor with whom you'll be working with and not the project. No amount of cool data can make up for a poor training environment. If I had stayed in that first lab, I guarantee that I would not have made it to where I am today. Throughout my career, my mentors, both past and present, have been one of the single most important factors to my success. From my undergraduate mentor who patiently explained to me how to do lab work and guided me through my grad school application process, to my current research mentor who has taught me how to not only survive in academia, but to thrive as well. Another thing that I think is especially important to imprint upon you is that science is fun, but it can also be hard. Again, I tell you, you will fail. And I mean this now in a literal sense. Your main task will be to uncover the mysteries of the universe. You likely won't get it right on the first try, sometimes not even on the second try or the 10th try. I'm not kidding. Ask your professors how many times they've done the same experiment over and over and over. And even if, uh, but even eventually you will figure it out and there is nothing more exciting than possibly being, if even for just a moment, the only person in the world who knows what you just discovered. Perseverance is one of the most important character traits of a successful scientist. And as people of color, our ancestors have persevered in the face of exclusion and oppression for decades. Believe me when I tell you that you can be a successful scientist and everything that you need to do it is already inside of you. As I begin to close, I hope that you will agree with me that it is past time that we redefine the word failure. Does failure really need to be thought of as a lack of success? Or can it just be a tool that we use to sharpen our perseverance in the face of adversity, on and away from the lab bench? And in my case, could it instead be the necessary redirection of one's path that aligns you with your true purpose in life? By following my heart and refusing to let other people limit my potential based on societal expectations of me and stereotypes of who I am allowed to be, uh, I'm now starting my dream career and have the opportunity to give back to my community, to train and to encourage students who look like me to similarly claim their rightful place in science. Be unapologetically you in this space and it will pay off. In fact, in my science outreach efforts, I have amassed quite a following uh, on Twitter and last year, guess who followed me? Yep, that guy. And I didn't follow him back. As soon as you, as you receive your lab coats this evening, I want you to promise me one thing, and that's as soon as you get into your labs that you begin to think of yourselves as scientists. And I want you to introduce yourself as such. Don't be like me where I waited till I graduated from PhD program to start telling people that I was a scientist. The dictionary defines a scientist as someone who systemically gathers and uses research and evidence to make hypotheses and test them, to gain and share understanding and knowledge. It doesn't define it as a crusty old man with crazy hair and weird glasses. And on a more serious note, it definitely does not define it as what we see represented across popular media and at our institutions. The moment that you step into your new research labs, it defines it as you. You are what a scientist looks like, and the sooner you take ownership of that title, which does come with some responsibility, the better off this world will be. You are the next generation of scientists, and we are so lucky to have you. Congratulations again, and I cannot wait to see where your journeys take you. Thank you.
Dr. Chelsea Spriggs, that was so beautifully said. You are such an inspiration. I was also a med school dropout. <laughs> now we are going to get to one of my favorite memories, which is the coding portion of the white coat ceremony. So if we could have all the Wayne State students within cohort seven, please stand up and line up alphabetically. That would be beautiful. And the people coding them, my apologies. All right, first I would like to introduce Esma Ali Sophie, and the person coding her is her dad. <laughs> Next, I would like to introduce Asia Flint, and the person coding her will be Camille Copeland. <laughs> Next, we have Bernard Love being coded by Miss Jennifer Tabb. Following will be Darius Love, who will also be coded by Miss Jennifer Tab. <laughs> Next, we have Emily Prinkosevic, who will also be coded by Miss Jennifer Tab. <laughs> Next is Irma Seljak, who will be coded by Christy Maytrucius. Next, we have Autumn Smith, who will be coded by Jesse Smith. And last, but certainly not least, we have Madeline Urima, who will be coded by Rita Urima. Next, can we have the Detroit Mercy Scholars, along with the people coding them, please line up over here. Rayan Agdar and Zainab Zain. Najat Assad and Dr. Kristen Abram. Abraham, Oops, sorry. or her brother, Shanice Beard and Dr. Shatina Jones, or her mother, or both of them, <laughs> Rebecca De La Garza and her mother, Kennedy Dunlap and Dr. J. McKenzie. Nixon De Leon, oh, my bad. Nixon De Leon Garcia and his father. Fatima Herrera and Dean Snyder. Ahmed Issa and Ali Issa. Nadia Khan and Tahir Khan. <laughs> G 
Gabrielle Mackinnon and Rahel Mackinnon. Diego Ramirez and Dean Snyder, or or Eric. Jude Rodriguez and Dean Snyder, or his mother. Savannah Skip and Dr. Shatina Jones. Xavier Sterling and Damon Sterling. Alexis Sleason and Joseph Hader. I'd like to congratulate all Wayne State and Detroit Mercy Scholars and welcome, to the welcome them to the family of scientists. I wish you luck on your journey. Next, we will have Dr. Shatina Jones handing out Scholar Recognition Awards. Y'all look good today. <laughs> look, 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 it's all about y'all today. It's all about y'all. Um, it is such an honor to be um, in the presence of people. Um, for some of us, we haven't had the opportunity to actually fellowship uh, with one another in person. And I think, I keep saying this, we're on another side of COVID. I don't know if we're on the other side of it, but we're on another side of COVID. So it's good to see you all. Good evening. So I have the honor of presenting two awards to two deserving scholars. Now I want to tell you a little bit of how we got here. So with the, with the Scholar Affairs Committee, typically we get together and we discuss things like grades, participation, and status um, in the program. Um, and depending on the scholar, there are just some who just rise above others. And uh, with that, all of our scholars are phenomenal scientists um, and researchers already. Um, so we wanted to recognize two individuals who have just, again, risen above uh, and have been exceptional scholars this semester. So I'm gonna describe this person um, because I pretty much know it's very unexpected for this, for this person. So this person um, came to us in the program a couple years ago. And this person uh, had an interesting journey within Rebuild Detroit. But one thing you need to know about this person is that she has a lot of fight in her. And she's so determined. When I first started in the program, I had the privilege of having conversations with her about returning to the program. And from there, you just saw this person who said, I'm going to be a researcher and scientist by any means necessary. And she has showed up not only for the program, but for herself as well. And this is uh, one of my favorite folks who I um, had the opportunity to coach. And I'll tell you this, um, Shanice Byrne, on behalf of the Rebuild Detroit Scholar Affairs Committee, we would like to recognize you as the exceptional scholar of the semester. And the next person is from cohort seven. Now this individual literally opens the rebuild room and closes sometimes the rebuild room. She is very curious, she is very curious for knowledge. Uh, she asks all of the questions to make sure she has everything just right. She's so very much passionate about the research and about her academics. I had a conversation with her recently um, about if you had the opportunity to talk to yourself from freshman year, what would you tell her? And she said to me, it's okay to make friends and it's also going to be all right. And when we had the opportunity to talk to her professors, they said the same thing. They saw 
just leaps and bound growth within her from her freshman year, not so freshman year, her first day of freshman year till today. So I would like to call up Rayanne. And with that, that will conclude my time and we'll have one of the MCs come back up. I would now like to introduce Dr. Katherine Snyder, who will be giving our closing remarks. Wow, you guys blow me away. I know that I'm between you and the end of the event, so I don't have a whole lot to say, but I have a few things. One thing I just want to say is how much you guys inspire me. We are at a time where there's a lot that's not very inspiring around us. There have been some hard times. There continues to be hard times. There's hard things happening in the world. There's hard things being said. And we, need, we all need a little bit of hope. And you guys give me hope. You give us hope. This world needs you. We need you. The scientific community needs you. We know that there are tremendous disparities in our world. There are really thorny problems out there that need solving. And we need you guys to do that. We need you guys to have the bravery, the curiosity, the faith in humanity to keep at it, even when things there's not a lot of reasons to do so, to support one another. I know we talked about that we've got this Rebuild Detroit family, and it's not only Wayne State and Detroit Mercy. You guys are part of a build family that's nationwide. There are 10 of these build sites across the whole United States. Now, we're the only one in the Midwest, and we're the best one. But, <laughs> but there are you guys are part of a national scholars program. You have a family that's not only here and at Wayne State and at Henry Ford, but across the country. And you have, to, you have to leverage that. You have to mobilize this community. And you have to lean on these folks. When you have a hard day and you need someone to lean on, you know you've got somebody, and you're going to be the person that someone else leans on when they need it. That's how we get through this hard times, is we lean on one another. But the inspiration that you guys are going to bring, the curiosity, the persistence, the faith that you're going to bring to your work is what makes it all possible for us. This is why those of us that work at universities work at universities. You, got, you guys are so inspiring, and, and you help us get up every day and do what we do, which is not always easy either. We need folks like you to inspire us, and you guys do. You do that every day. I'm really excited about what your career is going to look like. Please continue to come back and tell us your stories. I'm excited to see where you guys are going. I know that you guys are going to do great things, and keep on doing it. Thank you. <laughs>